Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. All right. So, okay. Welcome back. Welcome back. All right. So we, we have two, two orders of business. One question is what did you get from this book? And second question is what question do you have for Harold? Okay. Um, you can talk about, I, you can take some time. You can talk three minutes, four minutes about what you got from the book. Um, or it can, it can be very short if you want. And then go ahead and put a question on the table. The biggest question you want to ask, Harold. Um, maybe I can allow for two or three questions, okay? Because I can, because you're giving it to me in advance, I have capability of organizing it. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep track of questions. Harold is going to keep track of questions. I'm going to organize the questions. If Harold likes a question, he can he can answer them. But otherwise, I'm going to organize all the questions. We're going to start with those questions at the as the base for the next meetup. Okay, Harold is not going to answer any question now, but in the next meetup. Okay, so that gives him time to think about it. It also gives you time to think of additional questions. So you'll have more questions. You can ask more questions. But if you get your question in now. The chance that it will get answered is much higher. So get in your questions, vote early and often. Ask your questions early and often, all right? So go ahead and type exclamation mark to talk about what you got from the book and to ask a question. You can do both, you can do one, whatever you choose. The floor is all yours, folks. Go ahead, uh, we'll start with Joe. Joe, what did you get from the book? So, all right, I'm trying to gather my thoughts um, because, you know, you, there's so much uh, to be spoken about when we're, you know, talking about the book itself. Um, I'll try and highlight the most important things for me is I think uh, having a cl more clear understanding of the true, real, and ideal. And I think that having an understanding of that framework, those concepts is critical uh, into design because I don't think people often think about the ideal. Um, and so, uh, and most people obviously operate in the real. Um, so I think that, that, that having that framework is, allows you to really practically communicate to people, you know, what it, they're about their approaches, their models, and you know what is you know it just it just in a way to spur your own personal imagination. Um, I think that there's another aspect to this that's really important as well. I think you know desiderata uh, that you know the whole it, it it's not nearly you know merely just understanding what your desired outcome is, but as I had specified a little earlier. Uh, that you have to have an aim. Well, how do you have an aim? You have to have values. So what are those values? So what happens is you start to have a process where you're starting to actually really question what it is to, um, to uh, and you can apply this to your life, but to, to really have direction on where you're headed. And then when you're coming to this, idea of the ultimate particular, you start to get the idea of what is judgment? What is good judgment? And then how do you hone that judgment? Um, and then how does something you, you go from, uh, what is it to, you know, you, you go to the, to the real, you know, and then you can come up with the ultimate particular. And I find that many times in design thinking, the approaches that are taken, that are mostly boilerplate, pro, boilerplate approaches, that that part is lost, is like what the idea of the ultimate particular actually is. That people don't necessarily think about it, they just think about what the model is going to give them and what the outcome is going to be. So they'll come in and they'll have their set of business practices come in and practice as opposed to really thinking about What's the problem we're solving? How are we thinking about this from, from a from a much um, uh, larger perspective? I think that the individual and the community uh, link that is made continuously through the book is also one of those critical 
uh, things and and seeing ourselves uh, within the environment. I that you can go on for I, and I mean we could go on for a long time about that. Um, but I, I, I thought that that was, a, and I can go in about, you know, Louis Sullivan's inverted self and how that relates to all of this, but um, I'm going to try and be a little bit limited here because uh, there are a couple of other things that are, I think, that are, um, that are uh, worth um, mentioning. And I'm trying to think of oh, the, the composition assembly is, I think, a really, really important concept trying to look at things outside of their domains and kind of pulling them apart to see how they can be reassembled uh, and understanding what good design means with that. Uh, that's something that actually hits really, that hits home with me because uh, there are a lot of our engineers that I used to talk to on a regular basis uh, pre-COVID that would actually try to address that problem, how, you know, how to think about how parts could be, you know, you know, interchangeably used, and what other things they could come up with by by thinking outside of whatever their intended use was. Um, I think the digital and analog was is a profound point in this in this in this book. Uh, the digital and analog is that I think we've become so separated from processes by systems and technology and how our relationship with technology um, that we really forget what we're actually doing um, and how we're interacting with whatever task we're trying to accomplish. Uh, so that that's a very, very deep concept uh, uh, as well. Um, clearly, the idea of inquiry and action, you know, what, what makes for wise action? How do you inquire? Um, I, I, you know, I, I, that's, that's, I think one of the most important things that is the, that's one of the basis of the book. Um, there, I mean, those are the concepts I could probably put it into a more coherent narrative, uh, if I thought about it a little bit more, but these are some of the core concepts, uh, that I've taken from the book itself, um, at a very high level. Uh, I can go deeper no, that's, that's if nobody's it. Uh, um, Joe, Joe, that was very good. You you have extracted your revenge on Maritza, Evanique, and David by I did. <laughs> at least some of what they were planning to say. So that's that's good. Good. I that was the, that was actually the plan. I was actually just going to read the 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 uh, table of contents. <laughs> Uh, so that that, 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 that they wouldn't be able to, but um, I do have a question. Yes. So I my my question is, how does the design like the way design is being taught at say Stanford D school or design school or and and how its design is being taught at universities? What are some of like what is the fundamental difference between what the design way is saying? and the way it's being taught in universities? Beautiful, like, beautiful question. So how is design education, how can design education as it's currently being carried out be improved by ideas from design way? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Great, great observations. Next up is going to be uh, Maritzar, Charlie, Evanique, Cheng, Mike, and David. Marisa. So, um, you know, this, this book, uh, what I got out of it is actually, I, I got a very almost perverse pleasure out of seeing the whimsy in this book because it does not initially read as whimsical in any way, shape, or form, but it's there. One just has to see it, you know, um, so I'm going to, you know, tongue in cheek say to you that what I see is that the book is telling me to be more like a tree, but not just any tree, a mangrove tree. What's so special about the mangrove tree? Mangrove tree. Mangroves grow in salt water. Very little trees, few trees can tolerate salt water. Also a mangrove tree, A, has rods that breathe and appears to move. It 
shoots out those rods and moves forward. And it, it helps, it does all kinds of good things. So trees are neat. And I Uh, Maritza, there is a problem with your audio and video. Um, let's see here if she comes back in a second. Nope. Okay, let's go with uh, Charlie. And then when Maritza comes back, we'll go, go to Maritza. Charlie, what did you get from this book? And what question do you have? Okay, mine's very brief. Um, uh, basically, what I got was um, uh, my eyes were opened up to the incredible diversity in terms of understanding aspects of the design process. I had no idea that uh, that it was uh, so involved. And uh, so I, I'm appreciative, very appreciative of, of, of being um, enlightened in that sense. Uh, my question is, um, uh, uh, in your, how close are you to, um, uh, I'm assuming that you are uh, uh, come, intending to come out with a new edition, uh, uh, what parts of the uh, of the present book do you intend to make the most changes to, and why? And has this uh, group discussion had any influence in your choices? Okay. <laughs> That's kind of a loaded question, but anyway, forget about the last part. You don't need to talk about that. But I would be interested to see where where, where you intend to make most of your changes and why. Uh, Wonderful. Uh, you don't necessarily have to what? say where the, your ideas came yes. from. Yes. Uh, excellent. Uh, so I, I'll put it as. What is going to be your next book? Because it's going to be a next book. Uh, what is going to be your next book? And how is it different from uh, the design way? How will you build up on the design way? Excellent. Uh, next up is going to be Evanique. Evanique, go ahead. Actually, Maritza's back. So do you want her to Maritza go first? Back. Maritza. Yeah. Go Sorry ahead. about that. Oh, that, that was. Terrible. I feel like the universe didn't want me to talk about trees. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so uh, just I was just going to say, so, so trees, they're like this beautiful part of the natural environment, but they're also like amazingly efficient machines. And so if we, if we look, so they're constantly working, you know, to improve their environment, but they're not really doing it for the environment. They're doing it for themselves and for their brethren. Um, and, and so I think that's a really great way to view this concept of design process. What I get the most out of this book is this empowerment of taking on the mantle of designer. That is so powerful a thought process to me. For those of us who are not the architects in our day to day, to hear and to see in black and white something saying, you, yes, you too. If you're a gardener, you're also a designer. You know, if you're a mathematician, you're also a designer. You know, if you bag groceries, you are also a designer. And you're like, what am I designing? Your, your life. And, and that, that's really powerful. And so that's the biggest thing that I got out of this book is this of wearing that of walking forward and reminding myself that I'm designing as I go along. And, and the, it has solidified a few concepts that I had also already. The idea of um, constant forward movement as our path towards improvement or enlightenment or happiness or whatever it is you want to call it, that meaningful path is what I like to call it. It lies in taking on this mantle of designer. Why? Because the nice thing about considering that we're going to design our lives is that we're doing it, that design is active, not passive. And, and that is something that in the day, we, in the world we live in today, it's so easy to float passively. And then life kind of happens to you. But if we stop and consider, how do I want to design this aspect? And if you start to do that perpetually, well, now you're designing your life. And, and this book seems to say, it's okay. It's okay if all you're doing is bagging groceries. You too can still make judgments, take action, 
and start walking forward with those thoughts in mind. That way you're not just floundering around. Um, you know, there, there's so many concepts in here and, you know, I, I use intent. Intent is what I saw on just about every page in this book move forward with intent. That's really the biggest thing I got out of here. I will say that the question I would love to hear um, it, how to speak a little bit to us Arn, is there's a, a lot of confusion to me or it's not that I'm confused, but I hear many people talk about this concept of the one right solution. What I hear in these chapters is that there does not exist the one right solution. And I hear it so loud and clear that I do find myself often almost surprised when anyone mentions that there could possibly be a point somewhere in the book where they're stating. So my question would be, how do we move forward with intent in such a manner that we never forget that there actually isn't a one solution? And twofold part of that question would be, what if there is a time when there is a one right solution? How do we understand the difference between those two scenarios? Wonderful. Or do we have to? Wonderful. So I'll, I'll put it very simply. Is there one right solution? And when is it that there is and where is and there is not? So I'll, we'll just put that as, as a topic. So, so far, I have three different topics. So I'm looking at it as topics and I'm looking at it as questions. So one Thank is you. on the design education. Uh, second is on the next book. And the third one is on one right solution. So those are the three topics so far. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Maritza. Next up is Evanique. Yeah, so what I got out of the book is an overall uh, overview of design. Um, as a person who normally doesn't study design, it was very interesting to see how design is integrated in, integrated in every part of life. And I think to Maritza's point, just to reemphasize that we all have the ability to design our life. So I think knowing that is very powerful. But my question is... Um, who was the book intended for? Was it intended for people who studied design or was it intended for people who never studied design? And the second question is, um, how much fun has it been for Harold to watch everybody discuss his book? Okay. Um, and that was from Mbika. I'm not taking credit for that one. Okay, I, I, I am going to, I'm going to give you, I'm going to ask only two questions to Harold. The first question and the last question. The first question is going to be, what is his experience watching these meetups, watching us engage with his book? Because most authors don't get the pleasure of seeing that happen. So I want to see his, just his reaction to that. So anything he wants to say at length on that. So that's the first question. And the last question is going to be on the title of that final chapter. What's the way forward? What is his, you know, where do you think? Uh, where does he think? Uh, you know, people can take this forward, the ideas in design way, okay? Uh, and all, I'll just, I'll just have those two questions beginning and the end. Every, everything else is going to be your questions. Okay, so this, the second part of the question, I'm going to integrate into my first question and we'll, I'll ask it in that, that form. Thank you, thank you, Evanique. Next up is going to be uh, Cheng, Mike, David, and Jeff. Cheng. Yeah, this, uh, this book is, uh, as a designer, this book is quite beneficial for me, I think professionally. It's helped me understand the design process much deeper than I, 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 was, uh, I got bachelor and master degree in architecture and also practiced for 20 years. But this talk much deeper than what I was doing. So I actually learned a lot. And the helping to put PPT really helped me a lot. I want to summarize the main thing I learned uh, from one is design is service. I think a lot of time as a designer, we want to be, all want to be star architect. 
trying to fulfill our own ego or our own dream instead of like have this service service mentality to serve other people. Another thing is the true, real and ideal. I think it's a great summary. And contrary to what Joe mentioned, I think most of the architect or designer tend to live in the real ideal instead of real. We constantly have come back to the real from the ideal to deal with limited budget, limited you know, uh, time, limited resource. Another one is the uh, Desiderata. That's an interesting concept, you know, how the Desiderata come together with the client's initiation and the participate of designer to come together, come to this. And another one I really like is the reconstruct of Sophia. You know, it's the doing and thinking recombination. It's actually helped me understand a lot of the problem we are facing today, you know, is uh, the separation, you know, with education, it's also, uh, I deal with a lot of clients whose IT background, I found their education lack of appreciation of art or the, they're more non focus on numbers, you know, because the lack of art education. So I understand why there's so much different between the people because of education, separation of the Sophia. Another thing I learned, I think it's very, um, remind me of both is as a designer, it's so important to build your character, to have all this education responsibility to form the judgment. It's, a, it's not just for get the work done. It's kind of like, it's a lifelong designing of a designer. <laughs> so it's a lifelong pursuit to be a good designer. You have to work on yourself, you know, not just doing work. You have to study, you have to look at the building, you have to meditate. You know, I think it's a, it's a task, you know, because we have huge responsibility to do things that impact the reality. So it's remind me about all this. It seems heavy, but you know, it's also give us this sense of power too, you know. Um, also, I think, yeah. Also I mentioned to, um, I think David or something, you know, most of the architect designer actually not just serve the client. We always have this mindset of the society you know, bigger picture somehow because of the education maybe. So it's we are not just make serve the set. We want to make the city look better. I think that's kind of like the the baseline. Uh, I uh, my question is the like for the design. I mentioned about the, my bigger concern about design is the internet design. You know, my question is who hold those people responsible? You know, is that the government? or who you know should hold them responsible, how they change all the society. And also another question is uh, how we form this design culture. I think at the beginning of the book, they have this ambition to have this design culture, but um, then we go through all this basic thing about design, but how we move forward to form this design culture. Beautiful, beautiful question. So the two questions is how do we form the design culture and how do we hold the people who are producing things, uh, who, who are building the internet and all the services responsible? Excellent. Uh, folks, I never, I've never done this before, but please, I would like to give a round of uh, applause to uh, Jang for this incredible, incredible PowerPoints. I think she has added so much value to these meetups. So, so thank you, thank you so much, uh, Jang. Um, next up is going to be Mike. Yeah, I, um, I'll, I'll repeat what I said in the breakout room. Um, initially, for me, the book was was difficult because I wasn't familiar with the content, and I I found some things abstract. But then I realized it was more on me than the book because I had been struggling with. Uh, what I'll say, technology's effect on my ability to concentrate. And I, the more people I talk to, it seemed to be commonplace. So what I was able to do, and I found it very helpful, was kind of gridded out at the very beginning. And I've had conversations with people here outside of the meetups. And just by sticking it out, I started to get a grasp on what I felt was going on in the book. The main takeaway for me was what the book has connected me to, which was my past. 
with my dad being a tool and die maker and, and vivid memories uh, brought to life from conversations with my brother about what it was like designing in the 60s and then talking about with him what it's like designing today with modern technology. And most recently talking with my sister who did postgraduate work in phenomenology and getting a real insight into what other people in your realm are feeling and experiencing in design. So uh, the book had been very familiar to me. It brought me back to my family's roots, got my brother and sister to actually talk in great detail about their lives. It just made the book grow. And I'll finish with, um, I feel like I'm part of a team here. Uh, I, I think what we have done collectively here, um, like I look forward to these individual contributions every week and we gritted this out. This was not an easy book to get through. It took us in a lot of different directions and it was great. You know, someone I played a lot of sports as a kid, I haven't done this stuff in years. But I actually felt like we approached this like a team and we're coming to, to the finish line. And I'm not trying to be dramatic, but I, I mean that. It was a real uh, pleasure getting to watch everybody go through this together. My question is, and it ties into what I was mentioning about the technology, I wanted to ask Harold if he himself feels a technological shift uh, in the world and A and B, has it affected his thinking or the way he thinks about his book? So I don't know how you would post that, Srikant, but I think you know. Wonderful, excellent, excellent question. Um, the technological shift and how it has impacted his thinking about uh, design as such, this fantastic question. Uh, thank you. And uh, talking of, you know, uh, staying through and doing this as a team, I want to, I want to, you know, acknowledge the contributions of CJ. Okay. Because he's the guy who got us started on the book. Okay. First, I decided to go, go in for this book because I interviewed CJ on his book and he held up this design way four times. I said, why are you holding this book up four times? And that's how it got started. And then when I told him that I was going to do, I, and I just inhaled the whole book in, I think, four days. Um, and then I asked, I told him that I'm going to do meetups on it. He says, oh, you'll need to do at least 200 meetups. And I think that we've managed to do this. He, he's, been, he's been amazed by these meetups because he, he didn't think that we could do so much because partly it is because, you know, my approach and the approach of 52 Living Ideas it's, is integrative. And it depends not on one person giving you details of one idea, but having everybody look integratively at the whole chapter. And as Mike, you're saying, each person is bringing, you know, throwing light on different aspects of it. And in the process, everybody is learning a lot more about the chapter than they could possibly learn by themselves. So instead of zooming in, it's like several people like birds going around the planet of a chapter and pointing out various things to each other. So you can see the connections far more. Um, so thank you, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be David followed by Jeff. David. So um, I guess what I got from this book is uh, I enjoyed actually reading it. Um, it gave me an opportunity to kind of consider different aspects of my career as I've gone through that design process myself without the benefit of this book, by the by way. And it was very reflective for me because I could actually relive some of my prior experiences and what I had learned and what I had developed as, as a designer, I could see those concepts explored in the various chapters and in the various topics. Would have been great for me in my earlier portions of my career to have a book like this to um, use as a guide. And I think it, it I think it would be a great guide 
as your career in design develops, and that I guess one question I could ask the author would be how would he foresee his book being integrated into an academic programs um, teaching design? And my subsequent question would be, while I feel the book and a lot of the discussions have been focused on architecture, to me, the book is just an inherent great structured formula for learning how to design and what it means to design. So I don't have an architecture background. I have a systems theory background and an engineering background. And I found the subjects and the topics and the concepts explored in this book totally applicable that you could use in really any discipline where you're going through that creative process. And I think that's, that's truly the power of this book is to help guide you through your development as a creative designer, not, not, a, not someone who's just you know, reinventing or improving upon a prior iteration, but when you're truly creating the new, something that hasn't existed before, as you move through that process, and I, and I remember when we had that discussion with the spirals, you know, and the multicolored spirals, which I found fantastic, great way to visualize that whole, the messy, if you will, that messy design process. And you need to be comfortable with that messy design. But being able to go through that process and, and understand how you evolve an idea into the various forms along the way. And eventually you work towards the ultimate particular. That I found to be ver a very powerful concept. And if I could have had that idea in that, that, that vision, if you will, of understanding how designs evolve, I think it would have been very helpful, you know, because I kind of went through the process, hit and miss, you try things, you find things that work, you find things that didn't work. And that, that I could see as I was reading through this book, he was bringing through and exploring, hey, you can try this and you can down that path. And then you have, sometimes you have to back up and think about it this way. And I think it would be very effective for people early in their careers to have access to a book like this, understanding that it's not a step-by-step -step guide. It's a more a philosophical idea that this is something that you're going to come back and revisit in more depth as, you're, as you mature as a designer, you're going to be able to understand this book at multiple levels of, of detail. And I, I, so I really found these meetups to be tremendous. And those are the, the, the questions, you know, how could, how does he foresee this design way being incorporated or used to develop the next generation, if you will, of designers? Wonderful. And not just in architecture, but across a broad swath of fields. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, David, and great, great observations. Uh, I also want to give a shout out for Robert and his multicolored spiral. I simply loved it. And I think that that was that was that was a great, great presentation. Uh, thank you. Um, next up is going to be uh, Jeff followed by Douglas. Jeff. Um, so uh, I, I really, as you all know, I, I really appreciate um, this. And, and Harold, thank you so much for writing this book and for sitting with us in it. Um, 
So one of the things that I gained is I, I think it's just a terrific um, identification and um, explanation of the elements of design individually, and um, and and their uh, you know their their uh, their interaction you know in combination with each other during the design process. You know, there's a certain alchemy that that happens here in the in the combination of things, from desiderata to to service to a variety of different things. So um, the elements and and how they work together, I thought, is really very powerful. I have two questions. One, and and both of these questions fall under this heading. Um, you know, there's there, a lot of the book sort of uh, speaks to the primacy of the individual designer. And in, in a way, sort of, you know, as, a, as an autonomous, authentic person who is responsible and accountable for their decisions and their orientation. And that's absolutely, you know, necessary that each person, each, you know, is serving in a design role accepts that responsibility and, um, you know, is authentic and, and that they're acting with complete responsibility for all of their decisions and they're accountable for them at every level. And the second half of this is the, of the assumption is the benefits and requirements of the design team of people who are going to be working together. And, and at the very beginning of the book, you know, the focus on that the purpose of this is to establish a design culture, that it's a relationship between people. Um, who are in, engaged in some sort of a collaboration where they're, they're gonna have disagreements, potentially major, significant, substantive disagreements and how they make decisions together, how they collaborate. So within that, you know, the primacy of the individual and the culture of the team, um, how would you define the, the, the culture between the members of a design team? And how would you define the culture between a designer and their clients or stakeholders. Um, uh, I'll offer you just an axiom I have, Harold, which is that uh, this is a leadership program axiom, but whatever, whatever you start out to do for people, even with the best of intentions, without their input and feedback, you will likely end up doing to them. Thank and um, I'll stop there. Great. Uh, thank you. So you're, you're asking, what's the design culture within a team? Within a team, and and then what's the design culture between the, the design designer and, and all the and all the stakeholders? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Excellent. Um, wonderful. Uh, Douglas, uh, what did you get from this book, and uh, what question do you have? Well, the book that teaches about. Um, ethics and about um, govern, you know, um, being a, like a designer. It's a lot of work. It's uh, difficult. It's not easy, okay, uh, to be a designer and what goes through it and how they have to uh, put it, uh, you know, a lot of, um, but they have to take more responsibility. You know, it's, it's a hard job. Let me tell you, uh, uh, I had a family, my uncle was a designer, okay, and uh, it was a lot of work for him. Okay, he's not around anymore. And uh, the big question to me is how to govern more, um, how to um, govern, how do we get more ethical and honesty? Uh, and um, for the, you know, designers to be that way, it's difficult to really, you know, uh, you know, as, as it is, because you've got a lot of people pushing you in one way or the other. You got this one and that one and so many different people. So that's the big question. How, if we can answer that question, maybe we can have a better society. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Douglas. Um, so I'm going to put it as how do you become a more ethical designer? All right, folks, uh, this is fantastic list of questions. So I'm going to just recap them. I mean, I, it's just wonderful to just see all these questions. I'm going to put them currently in form of just topics. I will work on formulating them better. So the first one is about design education. And I'm going to combine it with uh, David's question of how do you bring up 
the next generation of designers. Uh, he made this excellent point that this is not just for architects. Uh, this is for people as such. Um, anybody who's designing anything. Um, the next one is going to be, what's the next book? What is the development of Harold's thought from this book forward? Uh, next is, is there a one right solution? Next one is about the intention, uh, the intended, sorry, intended audience of the book. Uh, my questions in the beginning is going to be, what does Harold think about our meetups and our process of going through the books? What, what are his observations about it uh, at length? Uh, and the final question is going to be what he sees as the way forward. Um, how do we hold, how do we hold the people, the high tech people, people who are developing the internet and all the services responsible? Uh, I'll connect it to how has the technological shift uh, shaped his ideas of design? You know, how has it impacted his ideas of design? Um, how do we form design? Okay, how, let me come back to that. Uh, next up is going to be, how do you design a culture within a design team and between the designer and the stakeholders. And the last one is going to be, how do we become more ethical in design? These are some of the questions. Folks, uh, these are just the starting questions. Um, we're gonna start with that next time, but feel free to think of more questions and bring them. Uh, we will go ahead and incorporate more questions in our dialogue and um, really look forward to, firstly, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I think this was a fantastic series. It's just amazing to see the level of comments from everybody. It's just, just incredible. So thank you very much, everybody. We will, uh, CJ has a question as well. Joe? Uh, he has, uh, he doesn't, he has questions that will be coming as well. So I just want to I mention. mean, knowing yeah. CJ is going to be 200 questions. Okay. That's an uh, yeah. You may want to talk, you may want to coordinate beforehand and actually try and. I know, I know he has, he has, he has said that he has questions. Yes. Uh, I will, I will ask him and I will incorporate his questions. Uh, he, he's typically very detail oriented. So he will have like, seven questions per chapter and then we'll have to we'll have to that's if you're down. lucky yeah yes, that's, <laughs> that's right that's uh and i'm hoping that he will be there for the for this finale all right uh, i think he's planning to be there he's planning to be there fantastic i think he said he was okay okay wonderful i will i will i will send him these questions because that's going to say wait a minute he's you they forgot to ask this and he will have more questions as a result of it. So I'm going to send him the draft of this uh, as well to get him more excited about coming and attending. All right, folks, thank you. Thank you so much. And we will see you soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Robert. Thank you, everyone. Bye.